This episode is brought to you in part by Constant Contact. If you own a business, you know that success is all about relationships. That's why Constant Contact's email marketing makes it easy to create professional emails that bring customers to your door. Its smooth drag and drop design offers the most simplified editing experience possible. And Constant Contact even offers free live coaching on the phone, online, or in your neighborhood. So if you ever have a question or need a little marketing advice, there's always someone to help. It's a powerful email marketing made simple tool. See how you can be a marketer with a free trial at constantcontact.com slash podcast. Before we dig in, I want to introduce you real quick to Veridesk, who is sponsoring this show. I work in the wellness industry, and I know the negative consequences of not merely just sitting all day, but being sedentary. Studies show that even if you exercise, It does not eradicate the negative effects of sitting and not moving the rest of the day. Standing is just so conducive to movement and movement keeps my energy up and calorie burning up and all that good stuff. I love Veridesk above its competitors for two reasons. That's why I chose it. I got to keep my desk, which I like. I just plopped my Veridesk on top of it. It came already assembled. I just unpacked it and was set to go. Next, sometimes I just don't feel like standing. So in one fluid motion, I put down my desk and sit. Easy as that. So all the details are at veridesk.com slash podcast. That's V-A-R-I-D-E-S-K dot com slash podcast. Join the movement movement. Well, Christine, you're here because in polling our audience, you were recommended uh, to us and uh, I guess I also said, folks, we need also some incredible women on here because my wife had poignantly pointed out that we were a little lower on the female side than <laughs> a men's side. And so multiple people recommended you and that's why you're here today. Mm, well, thank you to all those people. Thank you to your wife and happy to bring some feminine empowerment energy to, to the community today. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious Kevin over married. So yes, <laughs> amen. amen. I'm, I'm on with that. Well, so I went and researched you, looked at your book. Uh, somebody had mentioned that you'd just been on the Joe Rogan show, which I know is a big show. I went and looked at that and saw your message and thought that is something that we absolutely need to dig into. So I'm really excited, especially as I've gotten into it further to bring this to the Ziggler audience. This is so of course on board with Zig's message and uh, you just bring some incredibly great perspective to this issue we're gonna dig into though. I want you to start by telling everybody your Zig story because it's tremendous. Yes. So back in 2005, when I was out pitching my first book proposal, I had an agent that was shopping it around every day. He would just call me with all the rejections. And by the time I got to the 29th rejection, I was just in tears. And rejection was my core wound. Like it was something I dealt a lot with bullying and from boys. And so I just, I hated rejection. And I just said to him, no, like, I just don't think I can take this anymore. Let's just stop. I don't want any more rejection. And he said, do you know who Zig Ziglar is? And I said, no. And he goes, do you know he got like 30 rejections of his first book? And if he would have stopped, he wouldn't be the legend he is today. And he wouldn't have helped as many people as he did. And I was like, I need to figure out who this Zig Ziglar is. And so I went and researched. I got C at the top and I was like, whoa, if that book got 30 rejections, (laughs) then I need to stick with, with mine. And so it totally helped me shift my mindset and Zig was a great teacher for me in terms of really understanding that I had the power to shift my mindset. And I, I was able to not experience as rejection and go, you know what? It just hasn't found the right publisher yet, but I'm going to stick with it because I know there's a mission and I know there's a message. So that was my first Zig experience. And honestly, without that first book, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. So I have him to thank for that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and we have... Very many incredible testimonies like that. Thankfully, from the folks we interview, it's such a gift to to hear that and then to have you here as a fruition of that. So in prepping for the show, you made a statement as we were talking, as I asked about, of course, the focus here is inspiring our true performance. And I want to read what you uh, gave me. You said to have true, aligned, and lasting performance, we need to be connected to the truth of who we are. We need to let go of limited self-beliefs, Turn down the voice of the inner critic, 
drop mask of who we think we are supposed to be and agendas of what we think we should do. Okay, dead on, obviously, uh, Zig's message there and his perspective. And we unfortunately know that so many people think that the truth of themselves is that they don't have much to offer. So right away, we'd of course say, well, absolutely, you do. However, to be honest, and this is where I want to ask you, give me your thoughts on stating, uh, well, in essence, saying, okay, it's one thing to say, okay, no, you're brilliant, or to say, well, you have the potential to be brilliant, and that's what we need to look at. It's, it's, it's different. I think it's easier for people to relate to one than the other sometimes, but give me a little bit on that as you work yeah. in this field. Well, what I have really seen is that every human struggles with some core misunderstanding, something, that something like, I'm not enough, I'm not deserving, I'm unlovable, I'm broken in some way. And we, we, it's, we seem to form these stories about ourselves at a very young age. You know, when we come into the world, we know we're whole, we know we're complete, we know there's nothing wrong with us. That's the truth of who we are. And we know we're here to share our unique gifts, but then things happen. And the brain, like if you study brain science, it really hangs on to negativity, right? It's just like a magnet for negativity. And we remember all the kind of hard things or the challenging things or the bad things we saw or the, people said to us and, and the, the positive things don't, don't stick as much. And so we create this story about ourselves and it becomes a defense mechanism. It's like we become hard on ourselves and we think we're not enough because if we're harder on ourselves than anybody else is, then we think it's some kind of protective device. And so by the time we're, you know, young kids or teenagers, or sometimes it waits until we're an adult, but usually by the time we're a teenager, we have a limiting story about ourselves and the way life works. And so we've forgotten about the truth of who we are and we've instead kind of gotten into a persona of who we think we need to be to be liked to be approved of to get attention and we become more strategic in how we are in the world than authentic because we think that that who we really are if we take off the mask that it's not safe to be that that we won't be liked we won't be loved in some way so Really, I, I, people, a lot of people say, I need to learn how to love myself. I need to learn the truth of who I am. And I really feel like we need to remember because it's there. It's just underneath kind of these walls of protection that we've built, but it's there. So it really is a remembering process. And it's honestly more simple than we make it. You know, it's more, it's, it's a simple thing. Like we are all expressions of love and we all have unique ways of doing that. And we are all brilliant in our own ways. And if we could stop comparing ourselves to others and trying to be some standard of who we think we need to be, then the truth of who we are can really be revealed. Okay, well, for, from that then, your book, which I'm holding up since we now have a video viewing audience, ah. the book is Expectation Hangover. Free yourself from your past, change your present, and get what you really want. Mm -hmm. That name caught my attention, Expectation Hangover, mm -hmm. but it takes a little bit of clarifying as well. So I'm going to ask yeah. you if you would do that. Define what you meant by ex Expectation Hangover. So I came up with a term because I had so many of them, and it's when one of three things happen. Either life doesn't go according to our plan. Like we set a goal, we have a plan, and it just doesn't happen according to our expectations, and we're disappointed. Or life does go according to our plan, like we achieve some goal, but we don't feel the way we thought it would make us feel. Like I get that great job, but I still don't feel fulfilled. I get into that relationship, but I still don't feel loved. Or life just throws us a total unexpected curveball, one that's not desirable. And so it's basically when we have any kind of disappointment that comes from unmet expectations or the unexpected that we don't want. All right. Okay. So sticking with the book, I saw that cover, uh, then I turned it over and my next uh, question comes right off of the back cover. It says, we all face setbacks we cannot mm -hmm. control, yet mm -hmm. we often forget that we have a choice about how to handle those setbacks. So as a lifetime Ziegler listener, a guy who grew up with a dad that taught me, hand fed me, spoon fed, fed me Ziegler, and this being such a primary me uh, message of Zig's, I, I can agree with that. I mean, there are many times when I have to step back and go, okay, remember, you know this, and act differently than my nature would sometimes do. My question for you, though, is do you find that there are some people that there's not a going back, though? They were never exposed to this. This was not a part of their upbringing. This is revolutionary, brand new information that, wait, really? I have to take this in a new, uh, for the first time, we speak to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the main reasons expectation hangovers happen. You know, a lot of times people think they're being punished or victimized or they just have bad luck. But really, when things don't go as we planned or we have disappointment or life throws us a curveball, we're not being punished. We're being given the opportunity to learn a very valuable lesson. And here's the thing, like as a coach and a spiritual psychologist for the past 10 years, people don't come to me and they don't come and say, oh my gosh, Christine, everything in my life is going fantastic. I thought we just... They come because something has happened where they're like, what is going on? I can't believe this happened. I don't know what to do because we, I think the greatest, one of the greatest human fears is uncertainty. Like we like to know what's going on. It's what makes us feel safe. And so there's this addiction we have to control, but it's really an illusion because we, we're not God. We don't have control over everything that happens in our life. And if we think we do, then one, we're setting ourselves up for expectation hangovers. Two, we're kind of blocking those beautiful, unexpected miracles that may come into our life. And three, we'll constantly feel like a victim or like we did something wrong if life doesn't go according to our plan. So for people that are, the, for the, are kind of like, oh my gosh, this is mind blowing that I have a choice. I thought I was in control of my whole life. I get excited when they're at that point because I'm like, this is great. You're in uncertainty and it's uncomfortable. Like just when a caterpillar emerges into a butterfly, that cocoon process is dark. It's hard work. It's scary. It's very unfamiliar. But what emerges is something new. And when people are in that place of expectation hangover, when they're in disappointment, when they're going through something challenging, that's like the prime opportunity for these new thoughts and new belief systems to come come into our 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 mind because you know we're more likely and and I see this I saw this in my own life and I see this with so many people when we sort of hit rock bottom when things really aren't going the way we want them to go oftentimes we're so desperate that we're willing to absorb new information we're willing to absorb a new way of thinking and sometimes it takes kind of getting hit by a universal two by four to wake up to a new way of thinking but I think our our soul, our higher conscious, our higher self, whatever you want to call it, is always yearning for the truth. And the truth is we are whole and complete. The truth is we don't have control over everything external, but we do have dominion over what goes on in here. And that we co-create our life with our thoughts and with our belief systems. And we have more power than we believe. Not necessarily control over the entire outside world, but we definitely have more power than I think a lot of us even realize. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. So, you know, one of dad's quotes is, is you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to what happens to you. Yes. So is, that a, is that a pretty close summation of everything that you were just covering there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I love, um, uh, I don't know if, if you, y'all have ever read me on Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, That's but he wrote about being a Nazi concentration camp and he said between stimulus and response there's a choice and inner choice lies that freedom and when we really get that we always have a choice in terms of how we respond and when we become when we become more aware of that 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 tipping that space you know and so that's one thing that I have learned as I've been you know student of life myself is that sure I still get disappointed but the time I spend suffering in an expectation hangover or disappointment is shorter. And the time between my expectation hangovers is longer because I have more tools and more practice in doing it. And when I can remind myself, okay, I may not like this, but I do have a choice on terms of how I get to perceive it. And that brings me to another one of my favorite definitions of a miracle is a change in perception. And where I think this gets a little tricky is that, a lot of people just try to be strong and they're like, okay, I'm just going to be strong and I'm going to respond to this by being strong and pushing through. And I think it's important to be mindful. I think it's important to be resilient, but I also think it's important to honor what you're naturally feeling in a situation. Like if you just had a breakup or if you just lost your job, you need to honor the fact that, Hey, this is a loss and I may need to have a good cry about it. I mean, may, may need to talk to a friend or a therapist or a pastor or somebody that can hold that space for me to have it. But then there comes a point where I need to realize I'm not a victim and I have a choice in it. So I think that when we're looking at our response, we need to leave that space for vulnerability and authenticity without going into victim 
or without going to the other extreme of just like, I'm going to push through and I'm going to be strong and nothing's going to stop me. Because I've noticed with that is then a similar type of expectation hangover will emerge because we didn't get the lesson that may have been there if we had allowed ourselves to be vulnerable and authentic with, with how we were feeling about it. So let, let me just follow this up because yeah. I just had a recent experience. Uh, I had a big keynote over the weekend this past weekend, 3,000 people. Awesome. And we had a lot of expectations, uh -huh. right? And so this is what happened. Uh, let's just call it 50-50. 50% of the expectations were above and beyond. The audience loved it. The feedback we got was incredible. I don't think I could have prepared any better. Everything was fantastic. But there were some other parts of it where we had expectations and we were like, huh, I wonder, you know, it's like, oh, that, hmm, you know, because we had some expectations. Well, this is what we found because we've dug into it every day since we've gotten back. I think the significant change in gold and almost a pivot, almost a, uh, I mean, it's exciting because it's almost like a turning point mm -hmm. that if the things, if the expectations we had, let's say it had all been good, we never would have dug in. Yep, exactly. Right? Exactly. But because there were things we looked at and we go, why wasn't it? What could we have done different? What is this telling us? Well, what it really made us understand is that we are absolutely on the right track. There's more opportunity than we could ever imagine. It's so much bigger than we thought it was, but it has to be framed a little bit different. Yeah. And yeah. so I love the expectations hangover because we did. We had a you know, we were like, hmm, you know, why was this so good? And that wasn't up to expectation. And yeah, now we realize exactly why. I love this story so much, Tom, because what you're talking about is curiosity, right? See, it's where people, I think, cause themselves unnecessary suffering is when they, they maybe have a little expectation hangover. And instead of going, hmm, okay, how can I learn from this? They go, I did wrong. I'm a loser. And they just beat themselves up and the inner critic comes in and they just criticize and criticize and criticize. And a lot of people use self-criticism as motivation. They're like, the harder I am on myself, then I'm going to do better. And so as much as they want to go and pursue their goals and be better, what they're using as their gas is being really hard on themselves. And after a while, although that might move you along the goal line of life, that's really depleting. And that's not the place we wanna come from. And I love this story so much because you really are talking about being curious and going, okay, what can I learn? Like, we did great and acknowledge ourselves for that, but then it's like, okay, how can, we, how can we do even better? And that doesn't mean we did bad this time, but we can learn and we can grow and we can improve without that inner critic. And that's the thing that I, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate. If people take away one thing from me in this interview, it's look at your self-talk and how hard you are on yourself. And are you afraid that if you drop your inner critic, you're not going to be motivated? And how can you find that voice of inspiration, that voice that pulls you forward instead of pushing and pushing and pushing yourself so much? Because it really does impact our ability to serve if we're coming from, from everything with that harsh inner critic and harsh judgment. So I love that story. Thank you. Well, if anybody listening feels like uh, I was wondering if Christine's been auditing your life, tapping your phone or something. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> multiple times here. I love that uh, a miracle is a change in perspective. I'll, uh, I'll borrow that. I'll give you credit if I can, because that's, that's beautiful. As we continue with Christine and get deeper into this topic, I want to thank two sponsors who helped bring this show to you. Zip Recruiter, as a business owner, the process of hiring new people is not my favorite thing to do because it usually is so time consuming which is why I like ZipRecruiter. With ZipRecruiter.com, I can post a job to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. ZipRecruiter's handy website shows trending career fields, cities, and searches. I can find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. I just post once and watch qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. No juggling emails or calls to my office. I can quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person quickly. ZipRecruiter also has 9 million resumes I can search through in their database right off the bat. And I can add multiple people to my account to make it the most efficient way for my team to find the best hire. 
If I run into any issues, no worries. ZipRecruiter's friendly and human support staff is always there to help. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been featured on Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, The New York Times, TechCrunch, and CBS, and why it's been used by over 1 million businesses. Uh, Right now, Ziggler listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ziprecruiter.com slash free trial. That's ziprecruiter.com slash free trial. I also want to thank Captera. It's the place you need to utilize before you buy any software. I run so much of my businesses using online technology, email marketing platforms, text marketing platforms, websites, and hosting companies. Captera has made all this incredibly easy. Uh, Take membership management as an example. I went and searched for it by category. Captera gave me 185. All of them have reviews. I can search by three stars or four stars or higher. I can filter by web-based or installed or by most popular. Then check this out. I can check the box of as many options as I want, then hit a link to compare them. That's just brilliant. Captera has an easy to use website with over 400 categories of software to choose from. So whether you need help with website building, customer service, or project management, Captera is just the place you got to go. And here's the best part. Using Captera is absolutely free. There's no obligation. You don't even have to register. It's a free resource that will help you make the right software decision. So join the millions of people who use Captera every month by visiting captera.com slash Ziggler. That's Captera. Again, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash Ziggler. You mentioned a little bit ago people's desire for, uh, you know, for certainty and some issues there. And it made me think of, okay, uh, actually you said this in the book, you said managing your expectations is not about lowering your standards. And okay, so here, here's an admission. You guys remember the successories posters with the great picture, yeah. the great yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then do you remember despair.com that came along where they took those and kind of flipped them around and these incredibly horrible negative comments in reality to life? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very pessimistically. It's funny, but it's terrible. And from that, it must have been from one of those that we got this thing of saying in certain instances, okay, you know, the secret to success is just lower your expectations, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, uh, that uh, you know, being in the wellness industry as I am, that gluten-free, dairy-free, you know, grass top pizza, you know, it does not taste as good as an authentic pie. But, and I'm <laughs> lowering my expectations, what it made me, no, but I love what you're saying. Managing your expectations is not about lowering your standards. So when you talk about managing your expectations, it feels like you, Christine, are saying, no, we want you to have, keep, and accelerate, have high expectations. Yes? Well, I think it's less about, um, it's kind of semantics, right? Because expectations is the eager anticipation for something to happen. Mm-hmm. And to me, having expectations is not that empowering. So here's how I like to think about it. When I'm talking about relationships with other people, I'll talk about two things, people and goals. So when I'm talking about expectations with other people, um, I want to have awesome relationships. You know, I have high standards in terms of the kind of communication and authenticity that I have with people in my life that matter most to me. But instead of having expectations of them, I create agreements with them. I don't expect them to be mind readers. I also don't go to a Chinese restaurant when I want nachos, meaning I know who in my life I can go to for what, instead of expecting someone to all of a sudden change. And I see this happen with people so often is they they want somebody to give them something their whole life. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a spouse, and they keep going and going, and they keep getting disappointed because they're expecting that person to change rather than accepting the person for who they are and finding what they need from other people and then communicating clearly and creating agreements with people. I think that a lot of times we set people up to fail in our life and we kind of test them. Like if you really love me, you'd know that I want this on my birthday instead of just saying, Hey, on my birthday, I'd really love it if you did X, Y, Z for me. That's an agreement. And that actually is a way to have loving communication with someone. And when it comes to our goals, I like to say, pursue your goals with secret sauce, meaning high involvement and high intention, but low attachment. So I'm going to, you know, look at my goals, set my goals, know that I gave it my all, be highly involved in it, but I'm not going to make my emotional stability, my self-worth, my happiness, my fulfillment dependent on the result of that goal. 
because that's where people get tripped up and get real disappointed and have an expectation hangover because they're so focused on the end result and the goal. And if they don't make it, they just make that mean something terrible about themselves. They're not really learning things in the process and also in the pursuit of our goals. Sometimes like we need to take a different direction. And so if we're too attached the way we think we want it to be, then we're back into that relationship with control and we're not leaving space for grace. Uh, amen. So I just did, Tom, you don't even know this. I did a show with my dad, Dan Miller, uh, who was here live with me a couple of days ago. We got to talking about that and about some of the aspects of seeing a vision. In this sense, we were talking about a faith-based standpoint and seeing God's vision in your life and trusting that. And yet how I, in my own experience, and I've found this with a lot of other people, have found that the method of the vehicle or uh, that, it, that it happened is generally, or how it happens is generally different from what I initially perceived. Totally, totally. And, you know, I'll tell you a quick little story right now. So I'm actually sitting on the floor in this bedroom in the house in the, in a valley, in the valley in, in LA because I'm actually shooting a TV show. I'm doing like a host coach role on TV show. Now, when I was young, I was, I was bullied a lot. And um, I was ostracized and there was an I Hate Christine Club and I didn't have any friends. And I went into a very severe depression, medicated for it. And the one thing my parents did that really, really helped me is they got me into acting classes. And I fell in love with the camera. And I loved it so much. And I, I thought that's what I wanted. That was in my heart. That was my longing. And I moved out to L.A. when I was 17. And I went on auditions and just nothing happened. And again, I was back to that core wound of rejection. And so I gave it up. And I worked in the entertainment industry behind the scenes. And then a lot of things happened. I had a quarter-life crisis, lost everything, and got on this path of personal development and became a coach and all these kinds of things. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, and this TV thing has kind of come back around, not on the timeline I expected and not in the form that I expected. And I think that's what we really have to trust is those longing in our hearts, you know, God's vision for us. It's like, we may feel, we may get the impulse way before it manifests in terms of form or timing, but we have to trust that. And I think so many people like give up on their visions and give up on their dreams because it isn't happening the way they want, or it isn't happening fast enough. But I always like to say, trust those longings and keep taking steps forward. And you don't know if it's your seventh step or your 70th step that's going to lead to something that resembles that longing, but don't give up on your longings, give up on your attachment to the form and the timing of them. I mean, yeah, the point that you make here, I mean, how you segment this is so significant. You mentioned something a moment ago about setting people up to fail when we have these expectations, reminding me of that, of that old quote that I heard at some point that expectations are premeditated resentments. And it mm -hmm. feels like you are throughout the book talking about that, but then you take it beyond just personal relationship skills. This is happening within your, what you expect coming out of school, what you expect in a job, what you expect overall. And we are then living, you don't say living in resentment, but in disappointment, I guess. Yeah. We kind of are collecting evidence for why our limiting story is right. You know, it's like if you have a limiting belief that, you know, making money is really hard and like you're constantly can't afford things, then then you're going to keep kind of keep creating that because that's what you believe. And every time you get a bill or your taxes are higher or, you know, you lose a job or something, you'll be like, oh, see, I'm right. I'm right that I can't make money and that life is hard for me. And so it's like we got to be aware of what we're collecting evidence for, because whatever we whatever we look for, we're going to find. It's like if you close, if I, if I say look around the room and notice everything that's blue and you look around the room, you know, everything that's blue and you've got it in your head. And then I say, close your eyes and now tell me everything in the room that was red. You're not going to remember as much because you weren't looking for the red. You were only looking for the blue. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, what are you looking for? And what are you collecting evidence? Are you collecting evidence for all the ways that you're supported and all the ways that you're loved and all the ways that you're successful and all the way people are, all the ways that people are kind you know, like I lived in Los Angeles for a long time. People, like, people would always say, oh, LA is such a tough city to live in and people are so superficial. And I'd say, well, that's really not my experience. Like, I love it. And I have met great people there because I was conscious of what I collected evidence about. Now, I was not born this way. <laughs> like, maybe I was born this way, but it took me some time to get back to this. Like, I really had to work on creating those new neural nets in my brain. And this is something that Zig's been so helpful with is that, you know, really mindset is our responsibility and a, and, and a choice. And it's, it's like exercise. And just like, you know, eating healthy isn't always the 
easiest thing to do. Being in shape isn't always the easiest thing to do. Having a clean mind and a positive mindset isn't always easiest because like we were talking about, our brain is kind of wired more for negativity. It's a survival skill, but we have the responsibility to be diligent and disciplined about it because that really is what gives us our power and our freedom. Yeah. And, and what you just said is the number one lesson that dad taught me. He's, he said, my favorite quote of his is you are what you are and where you are because of what's gone into your mind and you can change what you are and where you are by changing what goes into your mind. I think it was Martin Luther who said, you know, if a bird lands in your hair, that's okay, but don't let it build a nest there. Yeah. Right? And I think, I, I think it's important to, you know, I share this openly because I want people to know that this has not been that it was not easy for me. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about inspiring people is because I know what it's like to wake up every day and, and have negative thoughts. You know, I was, like I said, diagnosed with depression when I was 10. I was put on medication shortly thereafter and was on medication for 20 years. And so my brain, my thoughts were very negative and they were very kind of hard on myself and they were very, very critical. But when I started to realize that I had the potential to shift them, I, that's when I found my power. And, and I think it's also important to point out that there may be an awareness, like you, you, you get this, you resonate with what, what we're talking about and everything that Zig has taught, but then there's like some time before it integrates. Cause I think a lot of people have personal growth expectation hangovers. They read these books, they go to a seminar, they're so psyched and then they get back to their daily life and the inner critic is back or the depressing thoughts are back, or the negativity is back, and they get discouraged. And they're like, I failed at personal growth. It's like, no, 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 like, this is it. Like, this is where we practice. This is where we get that time to integrate. And so I just want to, like, be that voice encouraging people, like, don't give up. Don't give up. It's, you will get there. You can do it. Everybody has the same amount of human potential. So, and borrow our belief, right, until yours becomes stronger. Let me, let me test something that I learned recently. Uh, we do a lot with goal setting. And of course, I think a great goal is to put the right input into your mind. If we can control what goes in. But then I learned that, you know, only 3% are actually following through on a written goals program. Right. And so what I heard, I don't know if it's validated, but it makes sense to me. It said this, it said only about 20% really get excited about setting goals mm. of the whole population. Wow. Right. But only, and then only 3% of the whole population actually does goals. So even the percent that get excited about goals, it's a small percentage of them who actually do. But 80% of the world really likes solving problems. Mm. And then there's a real small group of people, they get, they get excited and jazzed about exploiting opportunities. And so we have some that are motivated by goals, some by solving problems, and some by exploiting opportunities. So here's the question for you. If you really believe a new mindset could change your life, mm -hmm. what if you viewed it based on who you are? Because if, if you're not goal motivated, the goal of getting a new mindset might be so far away from you. But if you're problem oriented and you know you've got a problem, mm -hmm. you're stuck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do I overcome that problem of being stuck? Well, maybe I need to, maybe I need to solve that problem with a new mindset mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. your opportunity motivated. And you know that people who exploit the biggest opportunities have this abundance mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you go that I'm just curious as to, does that resonate with all you've learned? That yeah. I, I think that and I love numbers. Those are so fun. Like I love to know the different percentages us. And, and what I love about just being human is that we're all like in so many ways and we're all different in so many ways. And I think we have to know that, what really inspires us most. And I would say like, I probably fall into the category of being super excited about goals. Like I love like when there's some, something to get to. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, so I love this. You know, I, I probably am fall, fall more into the category of solving problems. Like I like figuring things out. I love solving problems. I love to like 
puzzles were something that I loved doing as a kid. And so, you know, one of the problems that I wanted to solve was like, how do I, how do I feel better? Like it was a problem for me that I didn't feel good. And so I think a lot of people, if they, even if maybe goals are the exact thing they can't really name, you can think about how you want to feel. Like what you're feeling now isn't what you want to feel and experience. And that's a problem. So how do you solve that problem? How do you start to feel the way you want to feel? And that can happen before you achieve a goal. You know, I think we expect that once we achieve the goal, that's the thing that's going to make us feel the way we want to feel. But that in itself is a problem because then you're always going to be dependent on external results to make you feel the way you want to feel. And it was a real problem for me that at 26, I had achieved everything on my checklist. I was living this extraordinary life, super successful, had everything I want, everything I thought was going to make me happy. And I was still miserable. So I achieved all my goals, still miserable. That's a problem. <laughs> the formula is not working. And so what really inspired me was this is a problem I want to solve because the current formula I'm using to create fulfillment and success in my life, it, it isn't working. So I got to come back to the drawing board. And then that kind of got me back to the curiosity and the student being really a student of life. Like we're definitely, we definitely never graduate from life. We're always, always learning. And I think that if we can get into that mindset of constant then it's way easier to come from a place of curiosity and more of a place of how, what is this happening or why is this not? So I want to ask something coming back just on expectations. Um, we often, I think within the Ziegler show and message, we talk about the positive and negative effects of our, of our upbringing, you know, from our parents, how we were raised, uh, the programming, yeah. equipping, or lack thereof, and, and therefore expectations. And I bet most people are somewhat, I would think, aware of, of that. But, uh, you know, what we got from our parents are, again, upbringing. But in chapter two of your book, you talk about this, and you also outline these other areas that have done a lot to shape our expectations. And when I looked at it, I thought, I don't think that's something that I have ever thought that much about influencing my expectations. I don't know that other people have either. That's pretty significant. If you just look at your upbringing, it's going to be pretty narrow. We talk a little bit about, yeah, what are some other main pillars, main influencers oh in our lives that shape our expectations outside of just our meter upbringing? Okay. Sorry. Some of you, or that question cut out, Kevin. So what shapes our um, expectations outside of upbringing? That's the question. Yep. 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 Um, well, we're, we're constant sponges. So we're consistently taking in information. So obviously, yes, our, our parents play a huge role in our life, but as grownups, we have to stop blaming our parents. They did the best they could, but so do our peers. So does movies that we watched. So do billboards that we've seen. So does just societal expectations that we take in anything that, you know, we're so susceptible as children and we kind of take everything in and the unconscious mind is a sponge. And so part of growing in our consciousness and growing in our awareness is really looking at what do I really believe? And is that necessarily true? You know, I, for, for example, like I was always told since, you know, like, like I shared, I wasn't very popular. I didn't have a lot of friends. Like I won the science fair. So I was always told, oh, you're going to be really successful. You're, you're going to be so, you're so smart. You're going to be successful. So I believe that in order to be happy and worthy, I needed to be successful and successful looked a certain way. And my version of success today is way different than my version of success was in my 20s because that version of success was defined by other people. It wasn't my own version of success. So we need to look at, we're, we're kind of like computers in a lot of ways. And we're, we're programmed by everything around us. And I think part of growing in consciousness and part of personal development is, is not only being aware of what we think, but what we allow to come in. Like there's certain things, like there's certain channels that I won't watch. There's certain conversations that I won't partake in because I'm very cautious about what I allow into my mind. All right. Okay. So you talked a little bit about some timelines in your life from that. I'm, uh, so my grandparents yeah. grew up in the thirties. My parents, I think, you know, in the sixties, I grew up in the eighties. I'm guessing maybe you were nineties. I don't know, but social and cultural expectations of course have always existed. Do you see the reality of the manifestations of expectations being different in today's world or how do you see them being 
different in today's world? Yeah, well, I think that today the main difference is um, comparison. I think comparison is just toxic right now because there's just so many different ways that we can grab this and look at what everybody else is doing and make ourselves feel less than in some ways. And it's toxic. It's really, really toxic. So I would say that's what's different in today's world is that there's so many online personas. And I, I like to remind people that people's online presence is their highlight reel. It's not necessarily the behind the scenes right. and it's not necessarily reality. And, and comparison is the quickest way into forgetting who you truly are. And so I, I like to, you know, offer a tool for how to deal with that um, since there is so much comparison in today's world is we can either just try to like close our eyes and shut it out. We can let it really put us into what I call comparison coma or we can use it as a tool for growth. How I use it as a tool for growth is if I find myself comparing myself to someone or jealous of someone or looking up to someone, maybe putting someone on a pedestal and doing it in a way that makes me feel bad. I'm like, okay, no, this is not serving me. So what am I seeing in them that I'm not acknowledging in myself? So anyone that you're comparing yourself to, anyone that you're jealous of, they're stepping into some quality that you find admirable, that you actually have in you that perhaps you're not stepping into inside yourself. So maybe, for example, there's some um, entrepreneur out there that you're really comparing yourself to and you're like, oh, I wish I could be as good as that person. Well, look at what qualities are you really seeing? Is it their confidence? Is their ability to take risk? Is it their ability to you know, speak their truth? Is, there, is it that they're problem solvers? They think strategically, like right out, when I look at you, I see, I feel like you create and go, how am I not seeing those qualities inside myself? Because everybody's a mirror. So as long as we've got this and we have all these kind of opportunities to fall into those comparison comas, if you notice yourself doing it, use it as a way to see something inside yourself instead of making yourself feel less than. Okay. I, I want to talk about, you've mentioned multiple times in this uh, interview now, limiting beliefs. And that's something that we hear some, but I, well, I'll just own it myself. You have to think, okay, just limiting beliefs overall. Don't get real specific. I really appreciate to plug your book that uh, page 11, identifying your expectation hangovers. And I got to tell folks that the book is very much uh, set up as a workbook to work through, which you hear us talk about here on the Ziggler Show. Don't talk, just read something, study it, digest it, take it in, take action yeah. on it change. Absolutely how Christine has written this book. So literally, I want to give you the hope of that, that she's not just giving you this message. She's saying, no, here's how you can, she does multiple times in the books. Here's, here's how you can get in and understand how to uh, list these out. She gives you the different areas. So very powerful. So when you hear that limiting beliefs, she's going to help you understand, okay, what are mine? And probably is going to help you expand. That actually sounds kind of bad, but you're, you, you have more than you know, and you need to get them out of that table. So it's a great exercise. Um, and, and a part of that too that I want you to speak to, well, that again, testifies to your book. You use a lot of stories. You literally have testimonies in there of, okay, this is what happened to Mary. This is what happened to Bob. And I'll set it up for you, for you listeners in that she says, I really appreciated this. She said, uh, or wrote in there, there are many inspirational stories about people who have overcome huge obstacles and are now living happily ever after. We often hear the before and the after story, but how did they get to the happy part? And you have done that multiple times in this show. And I greatly appreciate that. We actually had a listener write in in our Q and A show and talk about that very issue. And they said, that's, that's, you know, I, I love all you guys and all the great uh, experts and authorities and su successful people you put on there, but we don't hear that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, if there's something that drove you to do that specifically, but you hit a void there that uh, I, I was, that's what it brought me right into the book. And I know you're meeting the need that people have because they want to resonate with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, part of what motivated me to write my very first book was realizing that who I projected to the outside world in terms of who I was and what was really going on, like in like who Christine really was and what she was really feeling were different things. Mm. And um, I thought that the way to get people to like me was to be what they wanted me to be. I kind of created some version of myself and I took a risk in writing that book. And I was just really vulnerable about like what wasn't going according to my plan and how I did quote unquote fail and just what I was learning from it. 
And I realized that that kind of vulnerability and, and sharing where I was without having it all figured out yet was really, really powerful because we never have it all figured out. And in that, that's where like the juice is and that's where the learning is. And I was like, if I can coach myself through this process and share how I'm doing it, that's going to help people more than if I'm already on the other side of it, kind of looking back. So all my books, like even Expectation Hangover, it was really inspired by my divorce in my early 30s. I was like, all right, I'm going to milk this for all it's worth. I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at like emotionally, mentally, behavioral, and spiritually what this is bringing up for me. I'm not just going to push through and I'm going to share about like the middle part because that's the growth part, you know, and that's where we really learn and that's where we get to. I mean, I love personal growth so, so much. But if we don't like show how we actually use the tools, if we just talk about the tools, then it's sort of just this aspirational thing versus this tangible thing that people can really relate to, which is why my books are so workbook oriented, because rather than me telling you the answer, I want you to find it yourself. I don't know. You know better for you than I could ever know. And so I would rather teach people how to fish because people have taught me how to fish versus just give them the fish. Okay, so here's here's a fish. I think it's going to be for some folks because uh, it's something I've never I've never heard it put this way. Uh, you said in the book, you said we must ask. Uh, well, go, talk about the middle part where it's hard. What am I learning, and why is this happening? And instead of just attempting to rid ourselves of disappointment, we can leverage it. Leverage disappointment. I've never heard that in my life. Tell us more. So. I, I believe that every disappointment is giving us an opportunity to heal something mm. like disappointment. Isn't just this random thing that happens to us for the most part. It's usually pushing up against some core wound that we haven't resolved some old belief, something from our past. And it's giving us this huge opportunity to go back and, and heal that and really learn. And like I said earlier, it's like in those times when things aren't going our way, when we feel a little out of control, that's when we're most open to learning something new because sometimes we feel kind of desperate and kind of hopeless. So it's like, all right. And by leveraging it, I mean that we can use that disappointment. We can transform it to become healthier emotionally, mentally, behavioral, and spiritually. Because if we go into that disappointment, we go, okay, what am I learning? What can I heal? What thoughts can I shift? What behavior can I change? How can I connect even more to my higher power, God, whatever that is for you, then you're going to be not just a stronger person after you get to that other side of that disappointment, but you're going to be more self-aware and you're going to have more tools. And so that's what I mean by leverage is that every disappointment can be an opportunity to grow. And, and to me, when we're, when we're in that state of consistent growth, that's when we start to realize that we really can co-create the life that we want versus just sort of like hope that it happens according to some plan. Does so, that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. So let me, let me pile on because uh, one of my friends in our certification program, he said, Tom, you're, you're not a nerd. You're an intellectual engineer. So they're really the same thing. Uh, so when you break a bone and it heals, it comes back stronger. Yeah. All right. And I'm kind of a nerd, so I studied neuroscience. And so when we when we do repetitive motion, we wrap a myelin sh- or a yep. sheet around the synapses, and the, the brain fires faster. And if we learn something incorrectly, but take the time to fix it it actually comes back stronger than if we learned it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that the strongest people that I ever meet in life, the ones who are doing the most good are usually the ones who've overcome the greatest disappointment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that leveraging disappointment really means is that often, you know, we, we so can try, try to control our path, you know, and where we're going in life and the direction we're heading. But often when we leverage this appointment, it opens up a new door and it sends us in a new direction. And often, most often that direction is way more aligned with who we truly, truly are. And like you said, it does form those new neural nets in our brain. And we do have that opportunity to, to, to change, to change. Like on a cellular level, we can actually change. Right. I remember in our business career, gosh, this was in the, uh, right around 2000. Um, of course, dad had had a whole lifetime of disappointments and successes and everything else. And we had a huge, it was a business failing. 
And I thought it was the end of the world, and he was just smiling. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, this is, we're, we're good. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's because, you know, his, his bones for, for overcoming disappointment or, or the fact that he knew it was all going to be okay was built on his experience of, hey, you know what? We just learn from it. We don't do that again, and we keep going. Yeah. And I think so many people, you know, and I was one of these people are so afraid of failure that they never go after what they truly desire and what they truly want because they're so afraid of failing. And my question, if that relates to you at all, is like, what is scarier? Never failing, which you can recover from or regret because you can't get time back. You can recover from anything like you really can, like taking those risks and going for what you want. I mean, there really is no such thing as failure in my opinion things don't always go according to plan expectation hangovers happen but you can always learn you can always leverage but to to you know have regret in your life and shoulda coulda woulda and i wish i would have asked that person now to pursue that business or taken that chance like that's a that's that's hard to live with so you know think about that like really i think that's one of the things we have to question ourselves and really be truthful with ourselves like you know, I'm, I'm keeping myself safe, but in doing that, what am I really keeping myself from? Okay. Well, thank you. Cause that's right where I was going. I mean, you guys are talking about being people being afraid of failure in my own trajectory. That was never, I, I'm not, I was taught to go try stuff and it's okay if you don't make it. But what I found, and, and honestly, it resonated looking through your book, reading through the book is that I, in, it, now I'm realizing I've been afraid of disappointment, of allowing myself to feel that, to feel the hurt. And so I would just press on, go to the next thing and run on. And you speak to this in there. And you actually said a little bit ago about some people uh, take it through straight. I got to be strong and I got to go on. So on that, again, in the book, and I wanted you to, to, to talk to people a little bit about this. It was disappointment's going to happen. And, uh, you know, expectation, a hangover is going to happen. Now we do, and we're going to end on this in just a moment on the, the preventing that from happening, but knowing that it's, it's probably going to, it has, how can you deal with it in a healthy way and an unhealthy way? And when you laid out the unhealthy way, and I honestly think that there, I want to say there was, you know, six or seven, uh, unhealthy ways. I thought uh, number one, no two. Yeah. Number three. Yeah. Four. No, that's not number five. Yeah. Doggone. <laughs> Relate. <laughs> yeah, well, unhealthy ways. I'm looking at that. It's great. And, and that is where I love getting out on the table going, well, yeah. geez, Kevin, that's what you're, and you know, allow yourself to feel disappointed, but then deal with it well. So we speak to a little bit about that, about dealing, uh, uh, do, doing it in an, a healthy way and an unhealthy way, dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the ones that are unhealthy and kind of perpetuate next expectation hangover and kind of guarantee that more of the same kind are going to happen are traditional numbing or distracting techniques. So over anything, over eating, over drinking, over spending, over gambling, over dating, um, over taking care of other people, getting involved in other people's life, over working, basically anything that we do to distract ourselves from feeling or looking at what we need to deal with, any kind of numbing or distracting device. And one that we all have to be aware of is working because uh, busyness is sort of a badge of honor in our world these days and like working long hours and, you know, and, and I'm all for work. I love my work, but like, are you distracting yourself for your work and sort of like using that as a coping device? Um, the other one is to jump too quickly to just the positive pep talk. No, I'm good. I'm good. Everything's fine. Like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Cause that's another way that we kind of repress and suppress the, the sort of natural feelings that we need to feel. And you know, we, we are humans, we have emotions. And part of what we're here to learn is how to release our emotions versus recycle them, how to have compassion for ourselves and be in a space where we can actually feel things without getting lost in it. And expectation hangovers give us a wonderful opportunity to actually feel feelings that we may have suppressed for for years, like for me in my divorce, like really going into the grief of that, like and really being able to explore feelings from all kinds of heartbreak in my life that I never really gave myself permission to really feel and heal. So don't jump too quickly to the positive pep talk and everything's happening for a reason. That's true, but give yourself the dignity of your process. And then we talk about another one, the being strong, like just pushing through, be strong, because we just shut down and shut down and shut down. And so really the 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 number one thing when you have an expectation hangover is to move into acceptance as quickly as possible. That's the healthiest thing to do is to stop fighting against it, to go, okay, I don't like this. This isn't ideal, 
but I'm going to accept that it's happening. Because I see too often we go into like if we get laid off, oh, that corporation, that job, and we blame and we want to find the reason and we want to know why. And all we're doing is fighting with reality. And I love a quote from Byron Katie. She says, when you fight with reality, you only lose 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's very true. So it's like, okay, I accept it. Now we ask the question, what am I learning? And that's really when I take people through that emotional, mental, behavioral, and spiritual process. But that first place you need to get to in terms of a healthy response is acceptance. Okay. And I do want people to hear that, that this is a, in, in the book and in Christine's message overall, she does hit, she just mentioned them, emotional, mental, behavioral, and spiritual, that this is a comprehensive way of dealing with this. And she's going to make sure you don't, you don't miss anything in your <laughs> efforts to deal with this. Cause I think it's easy for us to go to one spot. And so I love that comprehensive aspect. Well, I do then want us to wrap up with what you end with, which is what we would like to learn from your message here, learn how to deal with those past uh, issues that led up to where we are now, but then to go forward, how can we, is it really truly possible to prevent these expectation hangovers? Yeah. I, I assume you're not going to say, well, it's not, you're, not like you're ever going to be disappointed again, but how can we healthily go forward and not suffer from that anymore? Yeah. Well, you can definitely have less. So spank, like I said, the length of time between them can get longer and the time you spend suffering in them can get shorter when you have more tools. But I think the key things are some of the things we've talked about, you know, we're creating agreements versus expectations with people, taking responsibility, taking 100% responsibility for your 50% and any kind of relationship, really accepting people for who they are versus wanting them to change and pursuing your goals with that high involvement and intention and really enjoying the process and not being attached to that result or outcome. And when, when disappointment does happen, don't take it as punishment. And don't take it as I did something wrong, because as soon as we go into that, then the, the disappointment becomes more severe and the expectation hangover is more intense. And the overall thing is be a student of life, be a seeker. And like Tom brought up, be curious, you know, when things don't necessarily go according to plan or not according to expectations, kind of go, huh, okay, what can I learn? What can I learn without the inner critic? Excellent. Thank you so much. So that folks, I, the best thing I could offer you at this point, go get involved with Christine, go to oh, her website, uh, get involved, get the book and go through it again. It, it was uh, in a, in a quick, it, I had a really hard time getting past just the, well, the front cover, the back cover, and then right into it. And I had most of the show written as far as what I wanted to get into. I'm going to have to go through the rest of it as well. I want to work through these <laughs> because I absolutely resonate and thought I I'm dealing with some of those right now and it is not helping me. I want more. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for this. I'm eager to pass it on to people, but folks, um, uh, just thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks you. For it's my career. pleasure. And you know, people want to, I, I have a podcast where I coach people live on the air. So people want to hear how I work through some of these issues with people and learn more tools. Sometimes we learn really well when we hear other people be, be coached and be processed. So that's called over and on with it. If you want to kind of listen in to some of those coaching sessions, because that's another way that that's a good way to learn is kind of watch somebody else get coached because then our own defenses aren't up as much. Absolutely. Well, hey, thank you again. Uh, folks, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to this message and letting us walk with you as you inspire your true performance. And we get to do it with you. We will be back with you in the next Ziggler Show.